Hi, I'm Bill Rapisi, Executive Director of Lymphatic Education and Research Network, and I just want to take this opportunity to thank all of you for joining us today for our symposium series. I also want to take this opportunity to thank all of you who have become members of LEARN and help support this series so that we can continue bringing this kind of groundbreaking information uh, to you in your homes and offices. Uh, I would also suggest for all of you who have not become members of LEARN, $5 a month, you can become a member of LEARN and help support this programming and the research that we do. Thanks very much for joining us and I look forward to having you become a member. Hi everybody, my name is Katherine Holly. I go by Kathy. Um, I want to thank LEARN um, and their symposium se series uh, for inviting me to spend the time today to talk about living with lymphedema. And it's my journey, I'm a nurse, it's my journey as a patient and an advocate. So thank you um, for your time. A little outline about uh, what I'm going to talk about today is I'll talk a little bit about my background, the diagnosis of lymphedema. So we're diagnosed and what do we do now? Um, also, the reality of what life is like as, as a lymphedema patient. Um, I have a case study of a patient I met last year that really changed um, how I feel about my disease and what I'm doing about it to reach out and spread awareness. Also, I, I really, as I prepared for this talk, I, I reached out to the um, lymphedema community and to a lot of patients, and I got tremendous feedback, which I'm going to share a lot of that today. Um, and I'm going to end just talking about how we can be our own advocates, and there's really strength in numbers. So um, a little bit about my background. I've been a nurse for 34 years. I, um, I'm currently an operating room nurse at Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. And in 1979, I was in nursing school. I was in college down in North Carolina, and I had very painful varicose veins. So I, and I have a very strong history of venous insufficiency. So I had my right leg stripped of the varicose veins. Everything went great. Surgery was a success. Um, I finished college. I moved up to Boston. And in 1984, I was a nurse in a busy labor and delivery unit. And my leg started to swell, my right leg. Just a little bit at first. Um, it would go away at night when I went to bed, but I was working long hours. And um, it would appear during the day. Um, that was 1984, five years later. I never, certainly never made a connection with lymphedema. I didn't know what lymphedema was. I, um, I finally, after you know a month or so of this, I contacted my primary care provider. He um, didn't really have any any information for me. I, um, on my own, because I was a nurse and I knew folks at the hospital, I went ahead and contacted a vascular surgeon, made an appointment. He saw me. He said, yep, you have lymphedema. Excuse me. He said, you have edema where some kind of support knee-high stocking and take a diuretic pill. He gave me a prescription for Lasix. I took that. Um, and it did get rid of the edema, but as soon as that effect was over, the edema came back. I figured out that this wasn't solving my problem, and I stopped it. So all of my treatment, everything I've done for it and learned about it, really has been self-driven. I've, I've had to figure it out, and I think that's the story for so many of us. Um, I really didn't figure, put two and two together until the early 90s um, when I had access to the internet and could really research this. So um, I kept my lymphedema fairly private for 30 years. Uh, my family and friends certainly knew about it. I talked a lot about it with them. But um, I really, in the last two years, I've recognized a need to spread awareness and utilize my own experience and my clinical knowledge. So today's focus, this, this symposium really is about living with lymphedema and day in and day out, 24-7. Um, and what steps to take if you are newly diagnosed or if you think you might have it. Um, we'll talk about its treatment and management. It, this will be review for a lot of us um, with lymphedema, but I think there's a real need to um, kind of get back to the basics and um, share our experiences. And then I'll talk about our struggles and the solutions that we come up with to figure out how to live with this. 
So just the basics of the lymphatic system, um, just briefly, it's a network of tissues and organs removing the toxins and waste from our body. And I, I came across this recently uh, online. It, somebody referred to it as the body's own pool vacuum, which was really a good visual for me. Um, it's picking up all the debris within our interstitial space. Okay, so um, protein, water, um, and waste products are being um, taken up by these lymphatic vessels through our tissues and then moved through the vessels through our lymph nodes, which filter out, um, filter out the lymph and um, remove it from our body. Um, so it is our body's immune system. It's our main system of fighting infection. And the lymph flow is dependent on muscle contraction. So if you think about the circulatory system, which are our veins and arteries, and there's the heart that pumps um, the blood through, the lymphatic system, they don't, it doesn't have a pump. It's, it's a smooth muscle within the lymph vessels, as well as our muscle groups throughout our body. So that's why we'll talk a little bit later about why movement and exercise is important. There's over three liters, three to six liters, sometimes it's estimated, of um, lymph fluid um, that is produced daily, which if you think about a lymph, an area of our body that's not working, uh, the lymph fluid collects, and that's why it gets so heavy and so filled. Um, and there are six, over 600 lymph nodes in the body, which was um, interesting to learn. So what is lymphedema? It's the swelling that occurs due to the impairment or injury of the lymphatic system. Anything that disrupts the flow of that system and the flow of the fluid through the vessels can cause lymphedema, can result in it. it is, um, so it's the compromised removal of that waste, like I talked about. And what happens is it, it build, it's a buildup of protein-rich fluid. Um, which plays a factor in the, the risk, high risk of infection, which I'll discuss in a little bit. Um, and it, uh, 10 million people in the United States, uh, it's estimated, have lymphedema. And that's just here in the United States, not talking worldwide. Um, so the early symptoms. Heaviness, tightness or fullness, usually in an arm or a leg. Um, although you can, if you have um, an arm, uh, if you're at risk in your arm, it may, you may feel that fullness in your, what we call the trunk or your chest, uh, your abdomen. Um, it's a dull ache. Your you might notice your clothes or your jewelry is not fitting right. Your shoes aren't fitting right. Or you noticed your, your ankle's a little swollen. Um, if it doesn't resolve, call your doctor. Uh, if you've recently had surgery or you were, you know, you might have had surgery a few years ago and you are recognizing this now, reach out to your surgeon or call your primary care. Do your homework. I think um, what those of us who have been dealing with this for a long time have recognized that we're, we know our bodies better than anybody and we know these little subtle changes. Um, you might go to call your doctor and say, you know, my shoes are tight, my ankle's a little swollen. I'm not sure they would jump to the conclusion and to the diagnosis of lymphedema. So you, we really need to do our homework and be, um, be educated. So don't give up. Don't give up. We need to speak up. Um, insist on a referral. And uh, actually, I, I read just this morning on um, Facebook, there's a a lymphedema group on Facebook, which is a tremendous wealth of knowledge and experience. And someone said, my, both my legs are swollen. I, I'm, I'm worried that I have lymphedema. My doctor doesn't know much about it. What should I do? Who do I call? What kind of doctor? I, I think my recommendation, or it, this is my path, I'll say, is that I actually reached out to a certified lymphedema therapist. When I put two and two together, I actually called um, a therapist, a, a CLT, Certified Therapist, and made an appointment and said, I'd like you to evaluate me. So I just put a, a, a website here for uh, Lymphology Association of North America, and they have a complete listing of CLTs here in North America. Um, just briefly, I want to tell you an example of a patient just recently here in the Boston area. Her initials are SM. 
she had sarcoma removed off of her forearm. She had to have radiation. She had a little surgery to remove the tumor. And um, she knows me. She knows about my lymphedema. She called me. I spoke to her about a month after her surgery. And she said, Kathy, my, my arm feels funny. It's tingly. It just doesn't feel right. It feels full. And I, I met with her. I looked at it. And it was very subtle. Um, nothing obvious to anybody. But I knew what she was saying. And I said, call your surgeon, make an appointment, and talk to him. She did, and he, he, he's a very reputable surgeon here in the Boston area. He, she spoke with him, and he said, oh, no, no, I didn't do anything to your lymph nodes. I didn't disturb, I didn't disturb your lymph, lymph system. And she said, but, you know, I have this feeling. And he said, yeah, I, I don't think so. I think it's just post-op swelling. Um, she walked away from that and said, well, that's what the surgeon said. And I said, okay, we're not going to accept that. You know, we, we're going to look into it further. And um, she met with her radiation oncologist and right away he said, yes, you have lymphedema. So she's following up with a certified therapist. So it's just an example of even in, um, even today, this, this month here in Boston, the same, we get the same kind of, um, same kind of response. It's frustrating. So these are the types of lymphedema. There are two types, and this will be a review for some, primary and secondary. Um, it's interesting to see that greater than 40 rare disorders are actually associated with primary lymphedema. Um, it's a congenital or hereditary um, problem where you have absent lymph system or an abnormal lymphatic flow. Um, you're born with it. It may present itself right at birth, uh, and one of the conditions is called Milroy's disease, or you may see it in your teens uh, as a teenager during puberty, which is lymphedema precox, or later as an adult, uh, lymphedema tarda. The secondary lymphedema, which is what I have, is um, generally viewed mostly with cancer surgery, where you see here 68% of the cases of secondary are related to cancer, um, but there are the 22% that are, uh, are unrelated. And that's just, like I said, damage or injury to the lymph system. It really can be any surgery. Uh, I'll go over where the, where the lymph nodes are now uh, in a minute, and you'll see really um, it's throughout your whole body. Um, even if you don't take the lymph nodes out, there is a risk. Radiation therapy is, uh, does a lot of uh, damage to the localized area, as well as if you have an infection, um, a burns, if someone's experienced burns on their body or some type of trauma, um, an ac a car accident, you broke your leg, you needed surgery for something. All of that just puts you at risk, okay? So important facts, it's, it's unclear really who's going to develop lymphedema. Um, you look at a pool of patients that all have the exact same surgery or diagnosis. It, it's unclear. Um, there are some risk factors, like myself. I have a family history of venous insufficiency, but there are, there. It is unclear who's going to develop it um, afterwards. It can be immediate, the onset, or it can oftentimes can be delayed. Like mine was delayed five years, um, or even decades later. There is no cure. And it is a chronic, lifelong disease. It is 24-7. Um, in the United States, the highest incidence is with breast cancer surgery from, with axillary lymph node dissection. And there are over a half a million patients, it's estimated, here, just here in the United States, with lymphedema. Um, just a review of the lymph nodes. There's clusters all throughout our body. And as you can see here... Um, the cervical up here in the neck, if you're having head and neck surgery, you're at risk. Um, if removal of the axillary under the armpit, there are lymph nodes in your pelvis, um, in your abdomen, around your um, intestines. So you can see where if you're having prostate surgery, um, prostatectomy, that will put you at risk. Or if you're having radiation, prostate, you know, radiation for anything. If you're having gynecology uh, issues, cervical cancer, um, ovarian cancer, 
if they do um, radiation or just damage of the tissues can put you at risk. You could have a melanoma on your calf, but it, that, and they may look at lymph nodes during that surgery. So all of those things, uh, you know, like I said, just put you at risk. Uh, it, I came across this the other day. The National Cancer Institute in 2015 says that lymphedema is one of the most poorly understood, relatively underestimated, and least researched complications of cancer or its treatment. I thought that was a pretty powerful, um, powerful statement. So the stages of lymphedema. Um, there are... Well, four stages, really. The latency stage, which is what I've already discussed. You're at risk. You've had some kind of insult, um, and it's there. It's a potent, There's a potential. Stage one is what we call pitting edema, and you can see the image of the foot here where there's an indentation where you can push the fluid out. It's reversible, and it improves with elevation. And I had that for many years. Um, stage two is non-pitting. You can see the pictures in the middle down there of the legs. Um, I'm at stage two. So it's non-pitting. It's irreversible edema. You can push on my calf and there's it there's no indentation. It's it's a pretty solid. And there's a there's scarring. There's tissue scarring and fibrosis. Um, stage three is um, called something called elephantiasis, which I'll explain a little bit more. And that's a, a definitely a difference in um, the uh, distortion of the limb and the tissue. There's a hardening of the tissue. Here's elephantiasis here. Uh, the most common cause worldwide is a parasite. Um, it's called uh, filariasis, and it's carried by a mosquito in Asia and Africa. And it, the mosquito deposits this parasite. It travels to the lymph system and develops and blocks off lymph flow. And you can see it um, how, how distorted and um, affected these, these patients are. So lymphedema treatment options. I, um, I can't tell you how many times in my 30 years that my friends and family have said, can't they just, with all the medical inventions and technology, can't they figure something out like they could, you could tap your leg every morning and drain it? So I said, if only treatment was that easy. This is a a graphic done by a colleague of mine, um, I said, you know, can you draw something with a little faucet at the end? So um, if only it was that easy, but it's, as we know, it's not. So stage one treatment. Uh, the biggest hurdle is diagnosis. Um, as I've said, I, I think of being evaluated and educated by a certified uh, lymphedema therapist is, is really key. Um, I did not do that for years and years and years. Um, adherence to a self-care routine, you, you learn how to deal with this and manage it so that it doesn't progress. It's all about prevention of progression and doing that with some manual lymph drainage. Uh, you're, you're taught self-massage and compression. Um, there's also, for some people, it's indicated to use a pneumatic compression pump. Um, and sometimes that may not be as effective later on in the development of the disease. So stage two or stage three is the need for more intensive therapy. And um, there's a treatment program called Complete Decongestive Therapy, CDT. It is an intense four to six week, often four to six week treatment. I've actually done this, um, the, this intensive therapy twice in the last eight years. And um, it's done by a certified clinic uh, therapist. You spend, I spent, for my experience, I spent two hours every morning. Um, I would shower there. I would take off my bandages. I would shower in the morning, and then they would do about an hour's worth of drainage, teach me how to do my own massage, and then it's, it's a lot of um, multi-layer bandaging, taking care of the skin. So this is just an example of um, a lot of the bandages, and we use a stockinette. There's four layers. So you do a thin cotton stockinette uh, layer to protect the skin, and then you start rolling with bandages. And it's this combined effort of the four layers that really um, 
the goal is to push and move the lymph fluid as much as possible out of that limb. Um, oops. Excuse me. So sorry. There we go. Okay. Sorry about that, guys. Um, so this is, a, this is just a picture of that. Um, this is my leg, actually, four years ago. Um, and you can see it, it, is, it was 24-7. It, it is a very limiting, it's a very daunting experience. And um, it reduces, pushes. It's the best method right now to push that fluid out. Um, this is an example of before a woman with breast cancer related and then four weeks after, you can see the um, dramatic changes. But after treatment is just as important as that intensive treatment. It's again about preventing the reaccumulation of the fluid. You need to establish a self care routine, the pump, manual lymph drainage, and that's daily. I mean, these are daily, daily pieces of your care. Some people pump morning and night for an hour. Some people need it for 30 minutes. Um, and then it's about, once you pump out that fluid, it's about compressing it and keeping it from filling up again. And as one um, patient or lymphy, as we call ourselves, um, said, it's about vigilance every single day. There's also um, diaphragmatic breathing, learning how to breathe to encourage lymph flow through your abdomen, elevation, and exercise in moderation. Um, swimming is great. Aquatic therapy is wonderful for your limb, well, for your whole body, but certainly for lymphedema. And honestly, I say this for myself, and I've heard this for many others, it's actually the only time when I'm in the pool or the ocean, it's the only time that I actually feel normal. Um, skin and nail care, nutrition, a very healthy diet, look for anti-inflammatory uh, type of diet. And again, it's about vigilance. So these are examples of different custom compression. There's many out there, all different products. Um, for people who have head and neck um, edema, lymphedema, these are options. Uh, I heard from a woman who needs, wears one of these every night, elevates her head every night. She had had neck surgery. And um, when she flies, she actually has to um, wear one because flying does the, uh, the pressure of the cabin. You, you have to take some special precautions with flying. Um, and these are just some other um, examples of, uh, for different body parts. My goodness, look what I'm doing here. Okay. So... So sorry. So let me tell you about this case study. <clears throat> this is a patient I took care of uh, last year, initials PF. He was admitted to the hospital for a wound infection. Um, he was morbidly obese, over 550 pounds. He had, interestingly enough, secondary lymphedema in both of his legs for about five years. Um, and it was interesting for me because it was a result of having his veins, varicose veins, taken care of. Now, of course, he was morbidly obese, so that has a great impact on his circulation, and um, that was a, a, um, a problem as well. While he was with us in the hospital, he had nine procedures in the operating room for over six-week time, and um, it was a great opportunity when I met him, and I actually, this was when I really started... Um, speaking up and, and talking and, and teaching people and spreading awareness about what his needs were. I felt it was an opportunity to collaborate with the staff up on his inpatient unit, the nurses, the physicians, the clinical specialist, and as well as the operating room staff. I really was his advocate um, because no one really knew he was in for a, a bad infection, um, but no one really... Um, was addressing his lymphedema issues. So this was him on admission. And um, it's a pretty dramatic picture, but I thought it was important to show, show people, you know, just the extent of this fluid-filled leg but bilaterally. Um, this was him on admission. And if you see here, these are his lower legs. 
um, when he came down to the operating room, he had um, the nurses upstairs wanted to provide some support, which was perfect. Um, so what they used, they had what they used, they, excuse me, they used what they had. And that was a single, single, single layer, uh, like an ACE bandage. You can see here the folds of the skin because of, of the um, extensive edema. And there really was a potential for constriction of his circulation. And you can, uh, let me show you here, you can see his, um, his ankle. It was actually hard for us initially, the first time we saw him, to figure out exactly where his foot started and ended. So um, I took this as an opportunity to go upstairs. I met with the staff upstairs as well as in the operating room, and we were pretty creative about bandaging. So you can see the difference before and after. Um, here he has, uh, I think we had three layers. We used what we had available to us and on his thighs, uh, those of you in, uh, clinically, we used uh, abdominal binders to help with his thighs. And, just, and I taught them how to do massage as well. So he lost 143 pounds in nine weeks which is um, pretty compelling, and it was all fluid. It was, it was a tremendous collaboration with a physical therapy team in the hospital. Um, you can see the folds, uh, how soft his tissue, his skin is now, and you can see the delineation of his foot. Um, I thought this was great. One thing I do want to bring up, and I think it's important, is remember we talked about, or I spoke about self-care and how to maintain this. Um, he had to return to the hospital a couple of months, I would say maybe three months later, three or four months later for some follow-up care. And, um, I had the opportunity to see him, um, which was wonderful. And he actually, um, his fluid had returned because in the facility where he lives, um, he, it, they didn't have the resources to take care of him. So um, this is actually before and after from that original visit, and you can see how, how great, um, how much improved his leg looks. But again, it's just um, a reminder that self-care is so important. So case study, these are his shoes. I saw them as he was getting ready to leave. He, I've never seen anybody so excited about a pair of shoes in my life. Um, this is the... Um, for perspective, this is my shoe next to his shoes. He had these custom made, and he, he was thrilled to be able to get up and walk, walk with these again. Um, so reality of a lymphedema life. Uh, this is the feedback um, that I've gotten from so many people. And there's this constant threat of infection, um, the cellulitis, that protein-rich fluid, um, uh, I don't personally have pain um, associated with mine. I have a heaviness, and it's it's very uncomfortable, but there are a great deal of us out there that have a lot of pain. Um, and it's hard. People don't, un people don't understand it. I mean, unless you're living it and seeing it every day, it's really hard to understand all of this. Finding clothes and shoes to fit you, sh tops, um, Anything that affects, you know, anything that affects a limb to such a degree is very hard to um, accommodate your wardrobe around. Your self-image and self-esteem is very, um, very challenged. Your body image, um, and that impacts sexuality and your relationships. Um, there's an isolation. There are people that haven't left their home that have lymphedema. Um, they don't. They can't leave their home because of their. They are so immobile, or they're so depressed. It really does a number on you. Um, and if you're dealing a double whammy, is if you've been diagnosed with cancer and you've had, say, a mastectomy, um, and then you develop lymphedema on top of that, and you're dealing with cancer and maybe chemotherapy and follow-up treatment for that, and then you develop lymphedema, and it's. It's very, um, it's really challenging. It's very, very hard. Um, there's no end in sight. It's a 24-7 thing. And then you can't forget, we can't forget the financial impact of all of this. 
So these are some direct, um, some quotes from people um, that I reached out to on Facebook. My legs are so bad that I haven't been able to climb the stairs in three years. I sleep on a recliner in the living room. Um, I've heard about this immobility and access to, to um, get out of your home and to manage in your own home. It can be a huge challenge. Driving, you know, if you, it, it's, it's very difficult. Um, this is cellulitis again. It's a vicious cycle. It's chronic, can be very chronic, and very often non-healing wounds. Um, there are recurrent hospitalizations, uh, antibiotics, very aggressive antibiotics to um, take care of this inflammation and infection, um, as well as very limited mobility, and you might be out of work. Um, and the medical costs associated with that. So um, this is where um, you're at higher risk for cellulitis if you're not really being, uh, if, you, if you're perhaps not being managed well, uh, having your accurate compression, um, because again, pushing out that fluid helps reduce the risk of infection. So um, it's a vicious cycle, this cellulitis. And people, I had a woman email me and said, she doesn't have good compression. She doesn't have insurance for it. And she's been in the hospital three times in the last year. Um, so this is a, a feedback I received. There's not enough time in the day for manual drainage. Then pump, wrap my limb, wash and dry, air dry the bandages. I can't work anymore. I'm in so much pain. I am mentally and physically overwhelmed. Um, I think all of us at some point in our lives in our day can feel that way. Um, this is uh, just a kind of showing different parts of your day. I came across this picture actually last night and I wanted to put it in. At first it was a little confusing to me, but so this is looking um, at someone's hand. These are the tips of their fingers and it's a cross section of all of the padding and compression, um, creativity in our compression to um, to reduce that arm swelling. So I, I thought I really thought that was a great a great image. So um, this is my what I call my lymphedema survival kit. Um, some people call it their toolbox, but these are the things that I can't I can't live without actually. Um, over here is a roll-on adhesive. It's called It Stays. Uh, there are several products out there, and I only learned about this about three years ago. Um, before that, my stockings, my compression stockings were falling down all the time and it was a constant struggle. Now I just roll it on the top band and it sticks to my skin and it's easily washed off uh, at the end of the day. It's, it doesn't uh, bother you at all. Um, again, skincare is very important. I happen to use Eucerin. Caring for your garments. I use a, a mild detergent. Dreft is what I use, but you need to look into that and use something similar. I launder all my bandages. I have about 30 bandages, and I launder them in uh, lingerie bags and then air dry them. If you don't have rubber gloves and you have tight compression, um, this is really helpful. These are very helpful in pulling on your garments and getting them in place. Um, another thing I don't actually leave home without is moleskin. You can get it at your local uh, drugstore. I put it right here on my ankle because it's an adhesive, uh, adhesive felt pad, if you will. Uh, people, some people use it for um, blisters. I use it because the compression can be so tight and irritating to the skin. This is feedback, actually, from others that have reached out to me. Carrying an antibiotic ointment in case you get a cut on your limb. Uh, bandage rollers to help, uh, it's actually, um, it's a pain in the neck to, to roll those bandages every night, so um, I should invest in this myself, actually. Um, a rebounder, like a little mini trampoline for um, exercise, if you're not able to do any other exercise or just keep moving your legs. Um, a lot of people use kinesio tape. I'm not familiar with it, but it might be something you want to talk to your um, lymphedema therapist about. 
diabetic socks to help protect your feet, and a dry brush um, to help encourage using it on your body, encouraging lymph, uh, uh, lymph flow. Um, the last thing here is a skin lotion, which I just learned about. It's actually for prosthetics. And it's a silicone lotion that people have said you put it on and it, your garments slide right over. Very nice, and it doesn't harm the garments, apparently. So I've been told. So these are some do's and don'ts. I know I'm giving you a lot of information, and I appreciate your time. Um, some of these are just uh, repetition, but you want to use sunscreen, insect repellent, use an electric razor. You don't want to risk a cut. Um, use extreme caution with your nail care. Uh, protect your hands and feet. Don't walk on the beach barefoot if you have it in your leg. Um, wear gloves, gardening gloves, an oven mitt, things like that that might put risk to your limb. Moisturize. These are some recommendations from folks. Um, and I think those of us who have been diagnosed, we know we've been advised avoid having blood pressure, IV starting in that limb. You want to, and this is all about infection, um, hot temperatures, extreme temperatures are tough for me. The summer humidity is really hard. Um, you want to have good hydration, avoid heavy lifting and doing, stressing your limb. This was, um, I wanted to share this. This really caught my attention. I think, you know, the necessity is the mother of invention. And when we are pushed to be creative, we can be really um, very creative solution. So my husband has had lymphedema since 1994. His legs are so heavy now that they are too heavy for me to lift when I wrap them. We needed the type of table like the therapist uses that goes up and down. We looked online and found the perfect solution, and it was affordable. It was a lift table to lift motorcycles. So um, for maintenance, you know, like in a garage or something, I think. And she said it works great. Um, this I went on the web, website that I shared down here, but um, I think, you know, if, if that's if if. Um, that's something that might work for some of you that have those issues. This is just an example of a lift I, can, I pulled off. I don't know if that's the one she used or not. But um, briefly, I'm going to talk about lipedema, um, chronically progressive disease, almost exclusively in women. Lucky us. It's a painful, very painful fat disorder of the um, adipose tissue. 11% estimated, 11% of the women. It starts in your hips and lower bodies. As it gets very advanced, it may go up to your upper body as well. And there's an estimated 17 million uh, women in the United States, 370 million worldwide. So how does that differ? Uh, oh, here, actually, here's an example of the different stages of lipedema. Um, and then we look, what are the two differences here? You can see, you know, this fullness and the full fluid filled leg here. The, the foot is very swollen. Um, on, on this leg here with lipedema, it's a different, it's more of a marbling, it's a different texture looking, and it's a different distribution of the leg. Um, down here you can see the delineation or um, between the foot and the fat of the leg. Oftentimes in lipedema the foot is not swollen. It, it stops at the ankle, which is interesting. And you can have lipedema and lymphedema. So, um, all right, costs of a lymphedema life. I'm not going to get into a lot of costs. We're all, we all live all over the world. We all have different um, coverage, and a lot of people don't have insurance coverage. But it is... Um, I'm fortunate. I have uh, typically I have about 80% coverage for many of my things, but you have the treatment course. If you're in an intensive therapy for a month, you have that cost. Um, I go every six months for a follow up. I get remeasured um, before I get reordered my my stockings. The pump, if if your insurance if you have insurance and it doesn't cover it, that can be five thousand to ten thousand dollars for pump. Um, there's all the bandaging custom garments, loss of work, and, and the impact on your family. Um, it's the quality of life impact that's a huge cost. 
this is the Lymphedema Treatment Act, and many many of us are, are familiar with this. Um, this was started by a, a woman and uh, a mother who had twin boys, and one of her twins has primary lymphedema. I believe that's my understanding. She started this movement and is quite an activist and has, has got a federal bill, the Lymphedema Treatment Act now, that's in Congress. Um, because Medicare does not cover the essential components of, of lymphedema treatment. And um, working with the congressman and government to look about an insurance, having insurance coverage. So um, one of their statements on their website says, compression is to lymphedema what medication is to many other diseases. It is indispensable. And um, I think all of us, all of this, all of us know that. So our influence is global. Um, we are a worldwide group. Uh, things you can do, you can start. Um, I'm fortunate. I actually um, have teamed up with a research scientist here in Boston who re researches the lymphatics in lung, in lung tissue. He and I are actually going to be launching a, a LEARN Lymphatic Education Research Network chapter here in the Boston area in the next couple of months. Um, and there are five or six others throughout the country. Uh, but if you're not from a big area, s start your own support group, you know. And I, I think this social media is, has been tremendous for me. I have, I'm new to um, all of this oh, spreading awareness and getting involved. Even if I've, I've had it for 32 years, I'm new to this. So I, I'm a, a new member on a Facebook uh, group, and I, I am overwhelmed by how much information and support there is. Reach out to your congressman about the bill and insurance coverage, or talk to your therapist or your lymphedema doctor about what resources there are in the community for you. Um, I think a, a huge issue, and certainly for myself in, in as a nurse, um, is medical education and how um, unaware and uninformed um, clinicians are. And, you know, there's, there's certainly not enough training in medical, in medical school uh, curriculum, and I, that needs to change. There's no question about it that, that's got to change. So we are a worldwide wealth of information and knowledge, and um, we need to share it with each other and our communities. So I hope, um, let's see here. Oh, I put together a lymphedema resource guide. These are, there are dozens and dozens and dozens of resources out there. This is just a list that I've utilized while I've put this talk together, and I thought it would be great to share and have all these in one place. Um, there's a nutrition guide. It's actually a book I just got. I haven't, I haven't delved into it, but I put that here, Lymphedema and Lipedema Nutrition Guide. There is... Um, there is a couple sites here about surgical options for uh, treatment of lymphedema, which I didn't get into. There are so many. There's so much more to talk about, but um, there are some Facebook, um, uh, excuse me, some Facebook groups on here that I've mentioned. So um, take a take a look at it, and maybe it'll be helpful. And I know I'm missing several good ones. Um, there's also, I put this together because there's so much talk about clothing and shoes and uh, living with it, as well as I put resources here for lip edema. Um, so hopefully that's helpful. Actually, my uh, certified therapist, Bonnie, told me to add this Old Navy uh, online. She said that there's uh, large size compression leggings. They're not medical compression grade, but they are... Um, she knows that a lot of her patients have used those, so that I thought that was great. I added that. Um, I want to thank Lymphatic Education Research Network, um, the LEARN organization, for giving me this opportunity. I never thought this would I would come be coming down this path and have, being a part of this, and I certainly uh, am grateful to Kathy Bates for being our spokesperson. Uh, and just a couple more thanks. I want to thank Bonnie, um, my CLT, and the group in New York, um, my colleagues at Mass General, all the CLTs out there, and specialists in lymphedema, um, and as well as all of you, um, those of you who have shared your experiences that I could share today. 
And this is a picture of me with a beautiful young girl, eight-year-old Emma, who has primary lymphedema. And uh, this was in the Brooklyn Bridge this past fall, where I met her for a lymphedema walk. Um, so that's it. Um, I hope that this has been helpful. And if anybody has any questions, I'd uh, love to hear them. Okay, thank you. What is a good way to handle it when I'm out in public and people ask me questions about what's wrong with me or they start staring? I am so uncomfortable with that. What do I do? Um, I think that's a great question, and I think every single one of us can relate to it. Um, not everybody is, you know, I'm a nurse, and I'm very comfortable, and only recently, I have to say. So I'm, I'm recently very comfortable talking about it. I'll actually show my leg now to just about anybody who wants to look at it. Um, and I take it as an opportunity to say, to educate. I say, um, I have a chronic condition that's um, a problem with my lymphatic system, and it causes chronic swelling. It's called lymphedema. So if, um, and that usually, usually they say, oh, well, that's interesting. So, you know, everybody has a different um, comfort level. And you can just say, I have a chronic condition. I can't control it. Um, you share as much as you feel like sharing. But um, I think that if we, if, if we're not comfortable talking about what we have, then um, I'm not sure how comfortable other people would be. So we need to improve uh, awareness. All right, another question I see is, you briefly mentioned the importance of exercise. Can you talk a bit more about that? So that's a great question. I'm glad you asked it. Um, it is, they say in moderation. So there is actually a great Facebook group called the Lymphedema Running and Fitness Club. And these are folks, uh, those of us with lymphedema that are, are big on fitness and love to run. There are people doing marathons. I think it's all about you need to control your um, disease, control your, your swelling, and do the right thing and pay attention to it. Um, my experience was I, I wasn't in control it was still stage one. It wasn't bad, but I wasn't really doing compression. I didn't know anything about um, custom garments, and I I did an extreme uh, athletic event eight years ago, which um, put me into stage two. My lymphatics got completely overloaded. So um, I think that's a great question, and I think there are really a great support out there. So good luck. Um, Rochelle wants to know, how do you get involved? So Rochelle is asking, how do you get involved? Um, I think, thanks so much. That's wonderful. Um, I Like I said, you can reach out to your community, but you could start. Um, I actually just, just this morning was online, and I read about a woman in Canada, and she has a pretty distorted leg. She actually um, got involved. She advertised. She got some friends together. And they had a fundraiser um, to bring awareness in the community and had a walk. It was like a 3K walk or something just to get people talking. Um, I think you can do that. I, I think, again, reach out to your doctor's office. Um, I actually um, have become like a uh, lymphedema resource for my primary care provider. Um, and his office, they call me when they have some questions. So um, I think the more we talk about it, the more, um, the more people will get us involved and we'll find opportunities to get involved. I used to be so uncomfortable. Let's see, this is from Casey. I used to be so uncomfortable discussing my condition in public, but now I just embrace it. It's who I am. I met, um, I met a beautiful girl five years ago, and now we are getting married. Isn't that terrific? Oh, and she doesn't mind it at all. Oh, I love those stories. Um, let's see. Thank you from Quebec. Well, thank you, Quebec. I love Quebec. Um, oh, this is Steve from Canada. Let's see. Exercise. Talking about exercise. Are there activity ideas to help with lymphatic, lymphatic flow 
um, some while sitting or laying. Yes, there certainly there certainly are, and I know that there are some great blogs out there and websites talking about how to uh, do exercise. Just sitting down, people watching TV, you can um, just move your legs, move your arm, rotate your wrist, um, sit and massage, gently massage your your limb while you're sitting. You're in the car. I when I'm driving, well. I shouldn't say this, but when I'm driving, I, you know, I bend my knee, I move my ankle, I keep my toes moving. Um, people love that rebounder. So uh, let's see what else. Also, there's yoga. Um, yoga is, um, people have really found great benefit from yoga. I actually just uh, signed up next week. I'm doing a yoga workshop. And it's specifically for lymphatic, revitalizing lymphatic health. So that's great. Um, let me see what else. Uh, let's see. Um, let's see here. Oh, great. Thank you so much. It's all about compression. Make, make sure your affected area is always clean. I have it in my right leg. So... I have my compression garment on uh, from the, oh, I hear you, from the second you wake up. I'm only out of compression when I'm in the shower. And actually, when I'm in the shower, I feel it start filling up. It's really, it's just crazy. It's just crazy. Um, okay, so I think that's it. Let's see. Um, oh, my goodness. This woman has had cellulitis over 10 times. And it is not fun. No, it is not fun. Um, my goodness. It's also, yeah, it's chronic and it's progressive. So let me tell you, uh, my last thing I'm going to say is if you have lymphedema, you think you have it, get it taken care of. Um, I had, I've had it for 32 years. I didn't really take care of it. I didn't know enough. And um, because of not stopping that fluid and that progression, it, um, it progressed. It can, it can take control of us. So we have to take control of it. Okay? Thank you so much, and um, hope you have a great day. Bye-bye.